Lindsay worked at the Lexington County Sheriff's Department in our technology vision. Lindsay was a very regimented person at this point in her life. She watched uh, what she ate. She made sure that she was getting her morning workouts. Our office has a shower at it. So she would hit her morning workout. She would get into the shower. She'd blare this loud music and get ready. And she'd be sitting at her desk at the Sheriff's Department, 8 o'clock, beaming and happy and ready to go. And on this Tuesday, the team came in, and there was no music. And there was nothing in the hallways. And that isn't right. It's not Lindsay. So at 8 o'clock, she's not sitting at her desk. That's not Lindsay either. Lindsay's best friend, who also works with her in the IT department, was concerned. So she contacted her boyfriend, who was a deputy at the time. And she called him and she said, can you just ride by Lindsay's house and check? Well, when he rode by and checked the house, her vehicle was outside. He touched his hand to it and could tell that it had been sitting there. It had condensation, so it wasn't warm to the touch. And when he went to the backyard, he saw that the gate was not locked. And as he went to the back door, he saw that the door had some damage to it and looked like it had been breached. So some kind of forcible entry was made into the house. As soon as they come in, the only thing they hear is running water coming from the bathroom. So they go to the bathroom, and the curtain to the tub is drawn. So they slowly pull back the curtain, and then that is when her coworkers see Lindsay laying in the tub, coffin style, with a huge six inch gash to her neck. They immediately cut off the water, get out of the house, and call for backup. Because at that point, it's clear Lindsay is not just dead, she has been murdered, and she has been murdered in a very, very violent way. When I found out she was murdered, the only thing I could think of is somebody had broken into her house. Uh, the neighborhood she lived in was OK, and she had never had any issues before. But that's the only thing I could think of, was like, who else would have done something like this? When we get cases like this, my first thought is, let's look at our victim. Because finding out who the victim is can kind of open up a case or can kind of steer you in a certain direction. We find out about Jason Lee immediately. Jason Lee was her first boyfriend that I knew of anyway. <laughs> and uh, that was her husband. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored and proud to announce Mr. and Mrs. Lee. The first time that I realized that Jason and Lindsay were having problems was she came to me and said that Jason had been emotionally abusive, verbally abusive. Because he kept calling her fat, and he kept calling her that she was ugly, and that she wasn't worth it. And those things were affecting her. So at the time of Lindsay's murder, she was going through her separation and was one month out of her divorce being finalized. A few hours after, Lindsay was discovered deceased in her residence. We got a call from the Midlands region of SLED who had told us that her estranged husband, Jason Lee, lived and worked in Greenville, about 85 miles or so from the location she was murdered at. And they had confirmed that he was at work that day. It's probably a 10-minute drive from the SLED office in Greenville. We drove over there. We asked to speak to Jason. His account was that it was a normal work day, that he had to work late. He was really exhausted. His foot was hurting, so he came home. He took a pill and something to make him sleep. He watched something on a streaming device and fell asleep. And that was his account for the day of Lindsay's death. After we interviewed Lindsay's estranged husband, Jason Lee, at his office, we asked him to come to the SLED office with us so we could download his phone. 
We all live, breathe, digital everything. Nowadays, everybody uses their cell phone, so it's almost like doing a computer analysis. There's a ton of data on it. The digital information we got at that point showed us that prior to the crime and just after the crime, there's a 12-hour period where it's turned off and nothing happens. Then all of a sudden, after that 12 hours, it's back on. That's considered a digital black hole. But in a situation like this, in a crime, when it occurs prior to the crime and just after the crime, it raises the interest of law enforcement when that happens. We find out that Jason Lee has a Fitbit. And I went back and analyzed the prior month. And what I saw with that Fitbit and what I learned from the Fitbit in the prior month leading up to her death is he wore it all the time. He would wear it at night. He would even wear it like he would have several steps in the middle of the night as if he'd, you know, gone to the restroom or got something out of the fridge. He wore it all the time. He never was without it more than like six hours. Well, surrounding her death, it was a black hole. Again, we had no data for the Fitbit. And that was concerning because we knew if he was at home sleeping and watching a streaming service, as he had said, he would be wearing it like he always is. So why would this one day in particular he not be wearing it? His Fitbit information tells pretty much the same story as his phone, that there was an effort on his part to make sure that his movements weren't tracked, that he took them off, laid them in his apartment, did whatever, left them somewhere during that time period, and then put them back on shortly after. And sometimes the absence of evidence is just as good as having the evidence itself. So while he did think about a lot of things, and he tried to plan ahead, it just didn't work out for him. About three days later, we're all in the newsroom, and we get the press release from SLED saying they've made an arrest in Lindsay Lee's murder. It was shocking that it came that quickly, but that also told me this was, in fact, someone that she knew. That was another shocker. Uh, he would have been the last person at the time that I would have thought could ever do something like that. Digital evidence has become the new digital witness for us. And in this case, it absolutely was. But I think that a jury would still want to know, how do you prove he was there? Jason's DNA is inside a glove that is torn and is scattered amongst all of the disarray and all of the chaos from the apparent struggle when Lindsay was murdered. I don't think he realized that that piece of glove had torn off um, during the struggle and was laid on the floor. And that was a huge Hail Mary for us when we got that DNA hit. When we searched Jason's car, we found fingernail clippings in there, which was very alarming based on the fact that Lindsay's fingernails had been trimmed at the crime scene, and there was no fingernails found at the crime scene. The nail clippings were taken to the lab, and they found DNA from Jason's blood on the nail clippings. Sometimes we have cases where there's a confession, or there's a lot of DNA, or we have really hard hitting one piece of evidence or two pieces of evidence. In this case, we had a whole picture 